please turn in your Bibles now to Job chapter 40. Job 40, this is on page 549 in the provided Bibles. Last week we finished listening to God's first speech to Job. We heard Job's reply to God, and although Job acknowledged that he's not going to go forward with his lawsuit against God, he doesn't want to compete against God, at the same time, Job did not fully yield himself and trust to God. And so there's something holding Job back. There's something more that needs to be done. And as we so often see in Scripture, God takes the initiative to do that. God reaches out again to his servant Job to call him to return to the hope and comfort that is found only in the Lord. So we'll listen to just the first part of this speech today. We'll save chapter 41 for next time, but today we'll read from chapter 46, verse 40, verse 6, through the end of the chapter, and we'll begin with the first three verses which have God's rebuke of Job. In these first three verses, God rebukes Job that Job has abandoned the fear of the Lord. Job has abandoned the fear of the Lord. So listen to God's word, Job 40, verses 6 to 8. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm and said, Now gird up your loins like a man. I will ask you, and you instruct me. Will you really annul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? God singles out a particular sin here. Remember in the first speech, Job's sin was that he darkened counsel by words without knowledge. And there were various examples of how he had done this. Now being, I think, a little bit more specific, calling on Job once again, summon all your strength to answer this question. Here is the charge. Job, you have put yourself in God's role. Specifically the rule of Judging the world. And and God shows this from three different angles in verse 8. First, God says Job has annulled God's judgment. Now, what's God's judgment? In this case, it's what we can see God has determined is right based on history. What God, who has appointed all things, has determined that this suffering should come upon Job. God determined this was right. Job has determined this was wrong. And so Job has annulled God's judgment. Next, God says that Job has condemned God. Will you condemn me? Again, who, gets, who has the right to condemn? That's what a judge does. A judge has the right to condemn. And then Job has justified himself. Condemn me in order that you may be justified. Once again, who has the right to justify someone? To say that someone is righteous? The judge has that right. And so from all three of these angles, in annulling God's judgment, condemning God, justifying himself, Job has put himself in God's place. And God is challenging Job on this issue because God wants Job to see that what is going on is not simply what we might excuse as, well, when it hurts this much, people can say some things and complain and we can understand that. Maybe we can have a certain amount of empathy, but God wants it to be clear. Job has adopted a worldview-altering position. He has turned things upside down. This is not just about Job's suffering. This is about who God is and what God's role is in this world. We can see a similar point made in different places in Scripture. I'll just read one from Romans chapter 3. Paul, as he considers the sinfulness of man and how we might respond when we hear the gospel, Romans 3 verse 5, he says, If our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? What What are people going to say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I am speaking in human terms. We are the ones who come up with this idea. Maybe God is doing something unrighteous. And Paul goes on and says, May it never be. For otherwise, how will God judge the world? It's inconceivable that the world can be judged by an unrighteous person. To take the position of saying that God may have made a mistake or done something unrighteousness is to change our worldview entirely. Now God does not say to Job, 
you have stopped fearing me. But I've, I've titled this in terms of the fear of the Lord. Job has abandoned the fear of the Lord because I think that is where this book has been driving us to think about this topic. So I want to go back and do just a little bit of a survey of this theme of the fear of the Lord in Job to bring us to this point. Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. That man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. This is his introduction. This is who he is. This is how God commends him. Verse 8, God says to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning from evil. Well, then Satan brings his attack. Job's suffering comes. Job refuses to deny God. And when God commends Job, God says, Job chapter 2, verse 3, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil, and he still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. What marks Job in his initial righteous response is that he is one who fears God. And then when things start to turn upside down in Job's mind, when he starts to speak his curse in chapter 3, Job identifies for us from his own mouth that this is a fear problem. Job 3, verses 25 and 26, Job says, For what I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet, and I am not at rest. But turmoil comes. And so the story of the book is a story of fear being turned upside down. Job's friends put their finger on this in a way that is at least partially right. Uh, Eliphaz, Job chapter 4, verse 6, he says, Is not your fear of God your confidence, and the integrity of your ways your hope? And the, the friends will continue to push that. Job, you have to get back to the fear of God. Now, tragically, they don't know how to direct him to get there. The friends can't, can't help him in that way. But Job loses his fear of God and instead gets a what you might call a terror of God. And that's where this wrong theology comes from. I want to read a more extended portion from Job chapter 9. Listen to Job 9 verses 22 to 24. Job is saying these words, It is all one. Therefore I say he, that is God, destroys the guiltless and the wicked. If the scourge kills suddenly, he, that is God, mocks the despair of the innocent. The earth is given into the hands of the wicked. He covers the face of its judges. If it is not he, then who is it? You hear how Job throws these accusations at God in his despair that God makes no distinguishment between righteous and wicked. He just punishes everyone. And in this state of mind, Job continues, Now my days are swifter than a runner. They flee away, they see no good, they slip by like reed boats, like an eagle that swoops on its prey. Though I say, I will forget my complaint, I will leave off my sad countenance and be cheerful. I am afraid of all my pains, I know that you will not acquit me, I am accounted wicked. Why then should I toil in vain? If I should wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with lye, yet you would plunge me into the pit and my own clothes would abhor me. For he is not a man that I may answer him, that we may go to court together. There is no umpire between us who may lay his hand upon us both. Let him remove his rod from me, and let not dread of him terrify me. You see how Job's fear is coloring what he is thinking and what he is doing. His fear of God is turned into this terror of God. And yet Job knows how things are supposed to be. As Job finally comes to the end of his speech, as Job chapter 28, he introduces his final vow of righteousness and he says the standard that he is going to follow. Job 28, 28, this is what God said to man, what Job followed, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, to depart from evil is understanding. Just one more character, our final character, Elihu. What is his summary Speech of what people should do, Job 37, 24. Therefore men fear God. He does not regard any who are wise of heart. So we see this whole book from every angle. The introduction, the narrative, Job's words, Job's friend's words, Job's standard, Elihu's standard. What everybody is trying to do is get us to think about this idea. What does it mean to fear God rightly? 
What does it mean to have our fear of God in place? Even when we suffer. And so God goes directly to the heart of the issue of fearing God. It's who's, who gets to be God? Who gets to be the judge? Who gets to decide what is right and wrong? And we can think of places in Scripture that, that talk about fear of God specifically like this. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14, the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep His commandments. Why? Because He brings everything into judgment. We trust Him. We are loyal to Him because He is the judge over all the earth. And so that is God's challenge to Job. Job has chosen a different fear. He has chosen to look to someone or something else. But here is what God now does in this speech. He puts the challenge very plainly. But he is going to ask Job to think through this in a, in a way of reasoning that I think we can readily recognize, which is, well, if we're going to move God out of God's job, who are we going to put in place? So God's challenge for Job is very simple. Job, consider the alternatives. Consider the alternatives. If you are going to let go of the fear of God, who is your choice to govern this universe? And we'll look at th- three different alternatives in the speech, just two of them today and the next one, Lord willing, next week. But the first option is this. Will Job fear himself as his own God? This is in verses 9 to 14. God says, Do you have an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like His? Adorn yourself with eminence and dignity and clothe yourself with honor and majesty Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and make him low. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him and tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them in the dust together. Bind them in the hidden place. Then I also will confess to you that your own right hand can save you. What Job has been trying to do is to put himself in the place of God. He has been committing this fundamental sin of exalting self. And I say fundamental because this is the sin that strikes at the heart of what God has taught us. Think of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Or think of the law of love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Job has not done this. And on this point, we should see ourselves as well in God's rebuke. This is a way that we have all sinned. We have exalted ourselves to say, on this particular point, on this issue, I think I know better than God. I think I would have done things differently. We are constantly tempted to that way of thinking. What Job gets told by God here and what what God also tells us is we can't just have it halfway. We can't just have the part that that we think we can solve. If you want to be God, then you can't be God in this little section of your life and ignore the rest of the responsibilities that God has. If you want to be God, verse 9, you need to have enough strength to do the work of God. You need an arm like God's. You need a voice that is so powerful that your words can create worlds as God's has done. Verse 10, if you want to be God, you need majesty, you need glory, you need splendor, these things that are appropriate to divinity alone. Verses 11 to 13, if you want to be God, you need wrath against sin. But you can't pick and choose. You can't just say, here are the sins that I want to deal with and leave other things aside. No, you need universal justice. You need to find all the proud and be able to look on all of them and humble all of them and punish all of them appropriately for their sin. If you want to be God, you need to be ready to do this task. But then, verse 14, very important. If you want to be God, you need to be a savior. You need to be a savior. 
Notice what God does here in displaying his majesty and his, his character and in describing the, the job description of what God does. Yes, he talks about things we would expect, power and majesty and justice. But he ends with this issue of salvation. Because Job, God's servant, who has suffered greatly, whose faith is wavering, what Job needs is salvation. And what God is saying to Job is, here's what the real God would do in this situation. The real God would be able to see you and have compassion on you and save you. The real God should be able to pull you out of this and to restore you to your fear of God. And Job, notice, you haven't done this for yourself. You haven't accomplished salvation for yourself. You've given it a a decent effort, maybe as good of an effort as any human can give, but really, it's amounted to nothing. We can't be our own saviors. So Job, why would you be your own God if you can't accomplish this all-important task of deity? If you cannot be a savior. And what's so wonderful about this rebuke is that as God rebukes Job and shows Job he is not up to the task of being God. God is displaying his own character and actually living it out in front of Job because he is actively persuading Job's heart to come back. God is not just talking about being a savior. He is saving. He is working in Job's heart to bring him back to trusting in God. And I hope as you listen to these words that God continues to work in hearts, that he works in your heart as well, that he pulls you back from the complaints that get stuck in your heart, from the questions about God's justice that you have to say, I don't want to do that job. I'm not, I'm not qualified for that job. My wisdom is to trust in God, who is powerful and majestic and just and committed to save and to turn to him. So this is God's first challenge for Job. The first alternative is that Job could fear himself as his own God. Next, God uses, once again, the example of an animal, and Job, God asks Job, will Job fear a peer in creation? A peer in creation. Listen to verses 15 to 24. Behold now behemoth, which I made as well as you. He eats grass like an ox. Behold now his strength is in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. He bends his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs are like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Let his maker bring near his sword. Surely the mountains bring him food, and all the beasts of the field play there. Under the lotus plants he lies down, in the covert of the reeds and the marsh. The lotus plants cover him with shade, the willows of the brook surround him. If a river rages, he is not alarmed. He is confident, though the Jordan rushes to his mouth. Can anyone capture him when he is on watch with barbs? Can anyone pierce his nose? I'm calling Behemoth a peer of Job because I think that God is trying to present Behemoth to Job as an equal in some sense. Let me just point out a couple of key statements that God makes. First, at the very beginning, God says, Behold now, Behemoth, which I made as well as you, or which I made with you. Job is a companion creature with behemoth. These two belong together in some sense. And then verse 19. He is described as the first of the ways of God. Now we know this can't be a chronological first. The animals were not the first thing that God created. This is a first of preeminence. A first in his category. He is, as we see in the description, he is a king of the animals. And so behemoth is first. And so why is he the first? Why is he this king among animals? Well, verses 16 to 18 are building us to this conclusion. Uh, His strength, his power, every part of him is marked 
by incredible strength. And then verse 20 creates further imagery. The mountains are actually serving Behemoth. They are, they are there so they can bring him food. And he has a domain, a territory, where other animals, smaller, lesser animals, are safe and free to play. And so Behemoth has this domain as the first of the ways of God. Well, it's not hard for us to recognize that this same statement can be made in parallel and is made in parallel to humans. Elsewhere in Scripture, I'll read just one example from the Psalms. Psalm 8, verses 4 through 8. What is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the seas. Whatever passes through the paths of the seas. See how the scriptures give to humans this same sense of preeminence. In fact, you might even say that Job and Behemoth have overlapping domains. They both have responsibility over the creatures. They both have a sort of a royal function that God has appointed for them in ruling over the creatures. And so the section ends with one question. God, God often asks questions all the way through these speeches. Here he describes Behemoth for, just with several statements to leading to one question at the end, verse 24. Can anyone capture him when he is on watch? With barbs, can anyone pierce his nose? In this contest, if there were hypothetically a contest between Behemoth and between people, who would win? Well, it's, it's left open. The, the outcome is not certain. People, you would expect, will have more intelligence, but Behemoth has more strength. And so they are presented as peers. They belong together. Now, who is this Behemoth that God is presenting to Job? What creature is this? My short answer is, I don't know. There's different things you can look at to try to answer a question like this. You can look at the word itself. Actually, behemoth is just the plural form of the word beast, a fairly common word, uh, but it's used of one animal, and so it's a plural that emphasizes the majesty. You might translate him, the, he's the super beast, the beast who's over other beasts. So you can look at context. Where else is the word used? Well, in Scripture, this is the only place. A behemoth is not used of a specific animal in the singular anywhere else in Scripture. So we look at the description, and a lot of commentators say he sounds like a hippopotamus. And I think he does kind of sound like a hippopotamus, so that's about as good a guess as any. I've heard he might be a buffalo, an elephant, a dinosaur. I'm not sure. Uh, some, some think even that perhaps he's a mythical beast. I don't think that's the best way to think about Behemoth at this point. He's, got a, he's a very earthy description. I think the most natural reading of this is that Job knows who Behemoth is. Job knows who God is talking to him about. And so I'm, I'm going to leave Behemoth at that. Job knew who God was telling him about, and he was able to understand this sense of a, a close peer, someone who has overlapping domain, and then to go on to make the applications. The applications Job should make should be as he compares himself to this creature that, like him, has been made by God and has a kingdom on this earth. Well, Behemoth, what is he like? He's a gentle animal. He eats the grass. Other animals play in his territory. And so there seems to be some commendable qualities here. In his habitat, he's an animal who is safe. He's confident. You might even say he's a, a fearless animal. Even when uh, the river, which he rests in and which is his home, when the river rages, it does not disturb him. Because this is where he was designed to be. This is where God has placed him. And so he is at rest, even when the river rages. And I think that is what God wants Job to think about as he looks at Behemoth. Job, consider a creature like you. I've put him in his place with these functions. And he stays there. 
Job, if you're going to look around for another god other than the one true god, probably Behemoth is not interested in the job. Because Behemoth is doing what creatures are supposed to do. He is staying where he is supposed to be. There's, there's a hint that Behemoth might become unruly. There's this statement in verse 19. Let his maker bring near his sword. But it's, it's not a clear statement uh, about what the sword is for. Perhaps if Behemoth were getting out of line, the maker would have the ability uh, to defeat him. Perhaps the maker wants to defend his creature from others who would attack. Because he's proud of what he has made. Now, what is clear either way is that God is the one who is in charge. God is the one who has control over this creature. Job is not the one that could fight this creature if he wanted to, but God certainly could. And so God asks Job, look at this creature. He is powerful, similar to you, but unlike you, he is at peace. He is where he belongs. Even when the river rages... He is not alarmed. Job, what about when your river rages? What about when your suffering comes? Where did your confidence go? What happened to your fear of God? With other creatures, a healthy mutual respect may be in order, but your fear should be directed to God alone. That is where your trust should be, and you should know that you are safe in God's hands. And so God calls Job to consider himself, to consider behemoth, and not to choose either one, not himself or another creature as God, but to trust in God alone. Now there's one more creature, Leviathan, coming up next time, and I think there are some further lessons that God brings then, but for now we'll just consider the application so far. And we'll use this question, when you suffer... To whom will you go? When you suffer, to whom will you go? I'm borrowing the language of this application from the Gospel of John. You may remember the story in John chapter 6 where Jesus feeds thousands and thousands of people, but by the end of the chapter he has said some hard words and almost everyone is left. And he turns to his twelve disciples and asks them, John 6, 67, You do not want to go away also, do you? And then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. See, Peter has adopted that same reasoning Job was asked to use. Job and Peter, very different men, very different stories, and yet they both needed the same lesson. All the false gods don't work. All the alternatives are not helpful. There's only one God who is powerful, who is just, and who is able to save, who has the words of life. It's the God who spoke to Job out of the whirlwind. It's the God who took on flesh in the person of his son and walked on this earth with Peter and with the disciples in the land of Israel. It is the same God who speaks to us right now by his word and his spirit calling us to him. To whom will you go? Who will you trust? Who do you want to do the job of judging the world? God calls us to trust in him. He offers as proof not only his words, but the actions of Jesus Christ. How do we know that God will do what is just, and that God is the one who is best for judgment? Well, we see Jesus Christ's death on the cross as a substitute for sin. And we see God accepting that sacrifice and saying it is just that he die in the place of his people. Why? Because he is a saving God. Because this is how he will accomplish salvation for everyone who trusts in him. And so he invites us and he calls us to turn from every false god and to fear him alone. Let's pray together. Our Lord, there is no one like you. We consider what Job said to you, the complaint of his heart and of his mouth, the way he blasphemed against you even, and calling you unjust. And yet we 
cannot condemn Job without condemning ourselves. Lord, we know that our own hearts have done the same thing. And so we thank you for this wonderful display of mercy that you confronted Job with the truth, but you did not immediately destroy him. Instead, you began persuading him to return. Lord, I ask that you will persuade us. I pray that you will draw us away from our false gods to worship and fear you alone. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.